All right. We are now on the anthropology part of the class. So while the majority of sources up to this point have been textual with some art history and archaeology, our authorities for the second part of the class are going to be anthropologists, but more so, who are our authorities going to be, but actual living Hindus. So an anthropologist interviews, observes, and reports, and the people he interviews are his informants. The informants actually become the texts of the anthropologist. So we're still going to look at some texts per se <clears throat> and scriptures to interpret the activities of people who the anthropologists are talking to. But the texts are just one of many sources. We shouldn't be thinking of texts or scriptures as being sort of the most important or the most authentic voice. It's just one of many voices. The texts aren't considered definitive. I mean, they're useful because they give you a historicity, but when you really look at the texts that inform a lot of like regular everyday practices, you find that the texts are fuzzy, messy, don't all agree. Different editions of the text will be completely different. You'll see that the majority of folks actually are informed by what we call laukika practices, or um, do I have this up here? No, I don't. Um, so laukika means worldly from the Sanskrit word loka. So death ritual performers, when Perry started interviewing them, Perry is the person we're reading, I'll talk about him in a second. He would say that when he would ask people, these specialty priests who do these sort of death rituals and care of the dead rituals, he, they would say that the Shastra or the written text or the authoritative text would be the correct version or the most important version. But in reality, when they perform these rituals, they need to perform them exactly as folks and the folks that they're servicing expect based on their own tradition, their regional tradition, their, their, their worldly tradition. So laukika means worldly knowledge. The, so if the Shastra is the scripture that's authority, authoritative, the laukika would be the practice. The so laukika would be the regional tradition. So um, again, so Shastra, prescriptive, scripture-based, authoritative, laukika, which means worldly, or traditional, or what re people really expect, what the average everyday person who doesn't know Sanskrit uh, and doesn't read these sources would think of as being correct. In a sense, in all of this, we're shifting from the Puran, from Purana, remember Purana means old or antiquary. We're, shift we're shifting from the Purana to the Laukika. Um, so we're going from the old books to the everyday practice of Hinduism. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of the course. Now, what do death rituals actually do? They aim to shift the spirits of the dead who are ghosts, dangerous ghosts without these rituals. The ritual intervention aims to shift the spirits of the dead into formless spirits. Um, so in this sense, you go from ghosts who wander around the recently deceased and then through rituals, they eventually are merged into a vast group known as ancestors. One um, French theorist called this le mort sans visage, the, the, the faceless dead. So the, the phrase that Perry gives are you go from preta, which is a ghost, praita, one who has gone away, to a pitri, an ancestor, a father spirit. You're going from troublesome ghosts to faceless, glorious ancestors. So the main activity of the ritual is not a triumph over death, not a successful mourning, not even assuring a heavenly rebirth or a salvation, uh, not even encouraging a, a good rebirth, not banishing all the defilements of death. The real work here is to wrangle the ghosts and to care for the dead. Now, the text we looked at today is a classic study of death of death rituals and of the economics of funerals and deaths in Benares. Benares is one of the most holy cities in India. It's on the river Ganges. Uh, and there's this statement that all who die there will be liberated. Now, this is intriguing. I always heard this when I first went to India. To die in Benares means you will be liberated, means you will get moksha. But when you really talk to people, and Perry found this especially, nobody actually gets liberated. When they talk about people dying, they talk about what we're going to talk about today, which is shifting someone from a ghost 
to an ancestor or possibly someone going to heaven. But there's very little discussion of anyone actually getting liberated, even though every Benarsi, a person who lives in Benares, will say, everyone who dies here gets liberated. It's good to die here. You'll get liberated. But then you ask how, and they're like, ah, nah, nah, nah. and you're like, wait, that guy, that thief and criminal? Nah. What about your uncle? He died here. Is he liberated? Ah. They, they get real vague. So they'll make that statement that everyone is liberated who dies in Benares, but that doesn't necessarily actually bear out when you listen to the sort of the details of what people are talking about. The book is simply called Death in Benares. It's fantastic. It's dense, but it's very good. Uh, Perry did his field work in the late 70s and 80s, and he wrote this magnificent book, which is dense and thrilling. I often feel that when I revisit it, and I revisited it many times, that almost like every paragraph or every page could have a whole article written about it. I mean, for me, almost the, the big chunks of it, I, I feel like it could have been three books, but it's just so rich. Now, when Perry's talking about his informants, he's talking about ritual specialists. So there are these Brahmins who perform the rituals for other people to get their ghosts or their recently deceased to become ancestors. But Perry also did this really cool other thing is he interviewed a group of people called the Doms. Now, Doms are an outcast group. They are untouchables. Now, they specialize in aiding death rituals. They do specific actions in there, um, but they also provide the wood for the cremation and they also manage the cremation grounds. So despite being untouchables, many of them have become quite wealthy doing this. Uh, and they'll talk about the Domraj, so the king of the domes or the rulership of the domes. So let's talk about the Domraj as a person. There is a specific person who's the head of this caste, and he's revered for his wealth and is feared for his sort of criminal powers. So it's a really interesting group of people who are inherently necessary, are untouchable, but are very powerful and have become quite wealthy. So this lecture is going to be in kind of two parts. First, I will discuss the nature of death, including good and bad deaths. Then I will go through very specific details of funeral rituals for Hindus in Benares. Now, this is very Benares focused, but versions of these rituals are found everywhere in India. Um, now, uh, every city, every village at the outskirts will have a shmashana, a, a cremation ground, and there people cremate the dead and do these types of rituals. However, unlike in Benares, what they'll usually do at the end of the rituals, they'll gather up all the bones that they call the flowers, and then they go on a pilgrimage on the one year death, which we'll go over in the, the one year anniversary of the death. We'll go over this in the next uh, module. And they, they sink those bones, they call it sinking the flowers those bones into the waters of a sacred river, preferably the Ganges. And that confers even more movement from ghost to benevolent ancestor. So first off, let's talk about good deaths and bad deaths. And I like to think of this a lot. How do we think about a good death or a bad death? Um, and, and I think some of this overlaps with Western culture. So Ideally, a good death is the voluntary relinquishing of life, not suicide. It's like realizing it's coming and let it coming out and let it happen. So gradually, the one who is soon to die will take less and less food, and they will only drink water from the Ganges, the holy river of India. Um, or they will drink uh, water that is left over from worshiping a deity. So after you bathe the deity or offer water to the deity, those leftover waters can be given to people as medicine, or maybe you give them to the, the people who are soon to die. Now, um, over time, the body is weakened, so the vital breath can leave more easily. Ideally, the soul will leave the body through the top of the head um, and not from the mouth with vomit or the anus from excrement. So one of the things people will do is when they watch someone die, they'll look to see what happens. Like they have a little burble of snot in their nose. They have an earwax or blood from their ear. Do they vomit? Do they excrete? Do they urinate? All of these show not terribly good trajectories of death. But if the person has none of those, they will assume that it's gone out the top of their head. And that's a good thing. Now, the body actually becomes a sacrificial offering. Think of the cremation fire that we're going to see as being like the Homa fire in a Vedic ritual. 
you're offering the body, your very body when it dies becomes the final antiesti, the final sacrifice that one can offer to the gods in a sense. So because the body becomes a sacrifice, you're going to want to get rid of the rotting food in your gut and the rotting excrement in your bowels so you can have the most pure body possible to be offered into the fire. The body is interesting in the cremation. It is pure in the sense that it is a pure oblation to the gods, but also contact with the body makes someone impure. So not unlike so many things with Hinduism, we're in a world of kind of confusing uh, amb ambiguity. Now, remember in Hatha Yoga, the yoga of pushing, I talked about raising the bindu up into the head. And then with Tantra, we talked about up and out. So think of projecting the soul up and out, just like in yoga and Tantra here in a good death, you're projecting the soul up and outward, and that will lead to a positive rebirth or a heavenly realm. In reality, we're going to see that the soul hasn't quite left the body at this point. Okay, so um, in a good death, and I'll let me just go over some more information about good deaths. So a person should ideally die chanting and hearing the name of God, and they should not fight death for clinging to life. Fighting death will cause death to get stronger, and if death gets stronger, it might take somebody else that's around you, take another family member. So don't fight death because death could become stronger and take more people. Struggle makes death more vigorous and there can be blowback. Blowback. So uh, also on this, you'll note that there's a specific period where people will vocally show their mourning status, that they are crying and weeping out, but only for a specific period of time. For the most part uh, it, among Hindus, Hindus do not weep or wail or cry for the dead except a very specific time because the notion is that ghost that's out there or the dead that's on its way to becoming an ancestor, if it hears people grieving, if it hears people weeping, they will be called back. The ghost will be called back. I remember being very upset one time uh, when I was in India. It was actually on a, I think it was on a birthday that I had there. And I was thinking about my own brother who died and I was spending time with a good friend of mine who's a Hindu Christian, but very much knows his, his Hinduism well from <laughs> growing up in India. And I remember him saying to me, Aaron, do not, well, he called me Arjun, but that's beside the point. Don't cry. Don't talk this way about your brother. You're just calling his soul back and his soul needs to be gone. I've always found that interesting. So a good death in this case should be on the, should be in Benares, in the holy city of Benares. Um, or somewhere on the banks of the Holy River of Ganges. Remember that the dead came out of the water in the Mahabharata and that one very exciting scene where the dead come back to visit with um, uh, Dhritarashtra because he's still grieving and Vyasa makes all that happen. So death should occur in the open air. Not, you shouldn't be on a bed. You shouldn't be under a roof. Now, why is that? Well, if, you're, if you die in a house, your soul, as it tries to leave, gets stuck with the roof. So you should be in the open air. And I'll talk about this more in a second. It sh you should just be on a flat platform bed or on the ground. But you shouldn't be in what they call, or uh, you shouldn't be on like a cot. Because the idea is your soul can get lost in the mattress or in the weavings of the cot or in the blankets. So you need to be free to get that soul out. Um, all people, as I'd said in Benares, are said to be liberated. And folks say this all the time, but it doesn't work out in principle. So you might not be liberated. In fact, there's lots of cases where people aren't. And, and the whole thing is not about liberating the dead as we look through these actual rituals. But it is said that any death in Benares is considered a good death, even if that good death does not confer liberation. Now, Death should occur at an auspicious astrological time. There are two astrological times. I should have given you, I'm sorry, I didn't give you a good slide on this. So there are two astrological times, namely when the sun is turning toward the south or the sun is turning toward the north. So when the sun is turning toward the south, that is from the summer to the winter solstice. So from June 20th to December 20, 21st. And when the sun is turning north, you go from uh, winter solstice, so December 21st, to the summer solstice, June 21st. Now, you remember that Bhishma from the Mahabharata was laying on his bed of arrows, waiting for the proper astrological time. He waited to die at the winter solstice. That way, his soul would turn north like the sun. 
Most people would want the soul to go kind of south, as we'll see why, because the south is to the land of the dead. But Bhishma, because he's thinking like a yogi, is trying to hitch his soul to the sun as it travels north so he can go to the land of the heroic dead instead of a normal death. I don't get the sense that people really think about this, this astrological understanding of the turning of the sun in reality. Um, but it would make sense that the best death would be from the summer to the winter solstice when the sun is heading south so you can follow the sun to the south to the land of the dead. And we'll see that everything is pointed south uh, in these death rituals to confer a good journey onward. Now, a good death is a product of a good life. Those with good restraint and balance and morality are thought to live long lives without disease, affliction, or mortification. And Hindus do believe that if you have disease, affliction, or your body is bad, it's because of prior sins from a past life. There's no escaping that. Um, the death of a child who has not cut its teeth, has not had its full teeth form, is not considered bad per se. The death of an older child who has already uh, had its teeth break in um, is usually considered inherently bad because the child is young. Dying young is a bad death. Now, for those people that have a bad death, they're not cremated. They're immersed in the water or they're occasionally buried, depending on which culture you're talking about. All right. So what are bad deaths? So a bad death occurs <clears throat> suddenly or accidentally. It's said to be a call at, a, at a, like a bad time. A death by violence, death by snake bite or a car accident, women dying in childbirth. Um, any folks that the phrase that, that Perry describes is people who don't die their own death. They don't choose and readily relinquish their lives. They're forced to die by some tragic event. This is death at the wrong time, especially death when still young. Bad death in particular makes ghosts that you cannot fix. So we're going to talk about how everyone dies and is a ghost basically for a year and you do all these rituals to make sure they go to the land of ancestors. But because you can't do these proper rituals on a bad death, because you can't cremate them, you have to put them in the water or bury them, they can't do these rituals, so they become ghosts that linger. They are bound for a world they have only half left, or they're bound to a world. So the ghost is there, kind of, but also gone, kind of. Because of that, ghosts tend to bring more death. They make people ill. They want to get other people uh, who are living into their in-between state. Um, yes, suicide is always considered a bad death. Uh, it may be voluntary, we argue, but it is caused by, there will be another, okay, so suicide is always a bad death, but folks have this idea that it's not a voluntarily relinquishing your life. Suicide is, in fact, you are so beleaguered by disease and depression that you don't die your own death. You're forced to die due to your illness and your depression. Um, yes, so a bad death is one, <clears throat> this is from page 163, a bad death is one then in which the deceased has revealed no intention of sacrificing his body, e.g. the victim of violence or accident or of renouncing its desires, e.g. suicide. Alternatively, it is that of a person whose body does not constitute a fit sacrificial art object. The extreme case here being the leper, though this also applies to the one-eyed and paralyzed, the goiterous, the hunchback, and the lame. So people who have disabled and very ill bodies in these specific ways are not considered to be worthy sacrifices, so they cannot be sacrificed, or if they are, it's bad. In reality, every, every, everybody gets cremated. They, they don't, there's only a, a few occasions when I've observed people actually being immersed into the river. Usually they'll just kind of say, well, he might have killed himself. But, uh, we're we're going to do the cremation anyway. Okay, so let's get into, um, let's get into the, uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, let's, let's say, actually, I want to say something more about this before I move on to this last uh, argument. So one of the problems here is that rebirth is only discussed in an abstract sense. So when we think about Hinduism, we think about reincarnation, we think you, you die, and then you're reborn, you have many lives, yada, yada, yada. Um, in reality, Hindus only discuss reincarnation if it's abstract. So when they're talking about actual people they know or family members, they talk about them becoming ancestors or they talk about heaven. 
they actually really rarely talk about reincarnation. I know I was spending time with my friend Rishi the other day, and uh, he's an Arya Samaji from the Punjab. And he was saying that, you know, he'd always thought Hinduism, he's a Hindu, was about rebirth, but nobody in his family ever really talked about people dying and being reborn. He said, when you die in his specific subsect, you merge with God or meet this ultimate energy and dissolve or maybe go to heaven. There is no discussion of rebirth. And he said, it's funny that they always talk about rebirth in past lives, but when someone dies, it's never thought that they're actually like kind of quickly reborn. This is not the case in Buddhism. So that's a little tricky. So rebirth happens for folks that people don't actually know or with whom they're not intimate. Usually people describe the dead as being nearby and around or as merged into a formless ultimate. As we'll see from the rituals that transition the dead from ghosts into shady presences and then into the formless dead of the ancestors, this is a common system. When folks actually describe death and the dead, they often speak in this way or describe that being met by blah, blah, blah. Hold on, that's a bad statement. Throughout India, you see people's pictures, the pictures of the dead that are displayed. And I don't have blah, blah, blah. Nope, here I am. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. So um, you'll see pictures like here of someone who has died and they'll be garlanded and people will give them um, and they'll give them sort of like incense offerings. They keep them on display and the dead are thought to be around. The funny thing about how this works is that, you know, first when somebody dies, you do all these worship rituals and whatnot. And you have the picture displayed well. And then like one generation behind, they have the picture out, but they don't actively worship. Three generations, they might have the picture somewhere. Fourth generation, they get rid of the picture. The idea is progressively the dead go from being specific individuals, they're kind of lurking around, to being vague things that you don't need to worry about too much, to being sort of forgotten. But they're not forgotten. The idea is that the dead becomes less and less, the dead become less and less individual over time until ultimately they merge with this sort of cosmic thing, the, the ancestors, la mort sans visage, the faceless dead. Your goal is to get the dead with a face, the person you know and grieve for, to become the faceless dead who live happily on as the, in this general world of the ancestors. So you start by doing these rituals as we're going to see in a minute for individuals, but in time they are merged into a general group that don't really have to be worshiped much of all. Okay, so what happens at the end of the body? What happens at the time of death? Well, the body can have three fates, Perry writes. It can be eaten as carrion and turned into excrement. So your body can be eaten by wild beast and turned into poop. It can be buried and turned into maggots, or it can be burned and turned into ash. Cremation is the best, the most subtle, and the most complete way to dissolve the body. Also, we'll see that ash is pure. Shiva wears ash. Shiva gives gifts of ash. Cremated body ash is actually not considered impure. However, feces, not so good. Turned into maggots, not so good. Ash, kind of holy. So cremation is the way to go here. Now, when someone is about to die, there will be omens or portents, signs that will happen. Dogs howling at night, dreams of naked women, dreams of a bride, dreams of teeth falling out. These are signs that someone is going to die. The inability to smell a lamp that's recently extinguished, because you know, we all know that smell, like when you blow out a candle, that smell. If you can't smell that, or feeling pain when your hair is plucked. I don't know, my hair always hurts. Man. Anytime you pluck my hair, I'll feel pain. But it's like specific types of pain, that's a sign that you're gonna die. Now, in fact, there's a long tradition of these death omens throughout Indian and Tibetan culture. Um, you can actually find texts, and there are really long texts on this. You have like sort of techniques where you can weigh a shadow or measuring someone's shadow and to see how long their life is because their life force is found in their shadow. You can have them to measure the amount of breath that you breathe out after you breathe in and that measurement will allow them to know how strong your life force is or if death is coming on. And tons more, there are whole texts about this. The Tibetans take on this tradition in Tibetan Buddhism and expand it wildly. I read through a text one time that had 
like a list of like 80 different signs that someone was going to die and what to do not to keep them alive forever, but to put off them dying so you can do the right rituals so they can have a good rebirth. But that's the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. There are some preparations to do when someone is soon to die. The soon to die person is placed on the ground that is, that is properly prepared. Remember I said they should be outside. Their body is, wa the ground is washed. It's plastered in cow dung. Cow dung is considered inherently pure in Indian culture as well. It's scattered with mustard and sesame seeds. The name of God, i.e. Ram, is written on the earth, and kusha grass is spread out. Kusha is a sacred grass that's found since the earliest times of the Vedas. In fact, it's um, it's actually really sharp. So like if you grow kusha grass and you use it in a ritual, and I've done this before when I was in a ritual, and you run your hand around it wrong, it'll cut you wide open. So it's a holy grass, but it's also kind of a sharp grass that will hurt you if you're not careful. Um, you're supposed to have death uh, eventually in the open air uh, to keep from the soul getting lost in the house or lost in an intermediate space between the bedroom and the roof. And it, the idea is the soul needs to go out. So you don't want anything to encumber the soul. Uh, the person is, should be sleeping on a platform bed, not a cot, because the soul might get caught in the webbing that makes up the cot. Um, we also see that ascetics, after they renounce, sleep on these platform beds. It's pretty much like sleeping on, um, <laughs> it's like sleeping on a coffee table. Uh, I've spent many a night on them. It's like sleeping on a coffee table. <laughs> it's like it's, you're just sleeping on a wooden table. And this is also where ascetics sleep. You'll notice here that when I'm talking about describing the ideal status and condition of someone who's dying, it sounds kind of similar to somebody who has renounced or is soon to renounce. The feet should peep, uh, the feet of the person who is dying as they lie down should face to the south. The south is the direction of Yamaraj, the Lord of Death. Now you're gonna see throughout this that everything should be pointing south. Now, where is the south? Well, south is the direction of Yama's stone house. The Lord of Death, is thought to live in a stone house. And south is also down. So it's the southern direction, but it's also deep under the earth. So always south direction and down when we're talking about south. In the same way, north is the northern direction and up. So um, Yama lives, the Lord of Death, lives down in his stone house, the house of the dead. And he hangs out there with his dogs and he's an accountant. What do I mean by that? There's an idea that all of your good deeds and your bad deeds are recorded in this sort of book. This is not the book of life or anything like that or something from the Egyptian book of the dead. Yama keeps track of everything, what you did good, what you did bad. And he audits it because he's an accountant. And once you go down to the, to the land of the dead and you meet with Yama, he looks at the good and the bad. And then he goes, all right, this is what's going to happen to you. And that, that is what it is. Um, yes, so the next thing that is done is gold or holy basil, known as tulsi, is placed in the mouth of the person who is dead, who is soon to die. An image of God should be placed nearby, especially a black, uh, uh, an image of Vishnu made out of black stone called ammonite. His mind should be on God. He should be thinking of God, and by thinking of God, this will affect a good rebirth. Um, if he has a bad thought, like the thought of having intercourse, then that will drive him to a bad rebirth. A lamp is placed nearby the corpse, um, or nearby the person until the corpse is removed. The lamp reminds the person, and I always think this is really cool, of the upward motion. So as you're looking at the oil lamp or the candle or whatever, you see that heat rises, you see that smoke rises. And the idea is that the person is chanting the name of God, hearing scriptures being recited, listening to holy music, and looking at this lamp, and looking at the way that the flame juts upward, and that should remind the soul to follow the smoke of the flame up, always up, <laughs> always up, except for the fact you're going to go down and south. I know, there's lots of contradictions here, because the system, like any good religious system, is filled with all sorts of contradictions and mysteries. That's what makes it compelling. In reality, we find in religious studies that if you have an outlandish claim that's completely ridiculous, nobody's going to believe it, but it's only slightly ridiculous. Let's take an example, like there was a guy who came back from the dead and died from your sins. 
that's like we can almost buy it that's enough that that's an idea that'll stick but um Yes. So, so these contradictions, I believe, are built in there. These mysteries um, and trying to work them out is part of the religious mentality that we seek to think through ambiguities. We're not terribly happy with religious doctrines that are very simple, but ones that are mysterious, those are the ones that lead to more. In fact, a lot of the rituals found in the Greek traditions are actually just called the mysteries, the mystery traditions. So this sense of mystery and contradiction is baked into religion. Okay, so the person has died. Now, the soul takes two trips. You take one trip to Yama, boom, you go to a stone house um, at the time of cremation. And then there's another journey that happens over the course of one year after you die and well, it's one year after you die. You take another trip to Yama. Um, in, these in these events, Yama's attendants puts a noose around the neck of the soul of the dead and guides them to Yama's stone house, where the divine accountant checks his ledger book to determine the fate of the soul. The soul then returns and tries to re-enter the body, but Yama's guards like, no, 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 don't get back in that body. Stay, stay out of that body. You're not allowed to do that. So for 10 days after death and cremation, the soul is thought to sort of hover around, uh, hovering around the scene of its death. It needs a new body, and that body will be created at the cremation ground in a specific set of rituals where there are offerings of the pindas. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's also this vague ritual that I don't quite understand that can happen right here where uh, the soul is thought, where somebody builds actually like a little moat and they color it with red water. And the idea is that the soul is thought to travel across those waters and it's part of something. I've never really understood it. I guess it's not done very often anymore. I don't know why I'm stuck still talking about it in this lecture. Well, anyway, then the band comes. All right, so the person has died. They get a stretcher or what's called a beer, B-I-E-R, made from bamboo and uh, the men of the family make the bamboo. The women at this point, while they're still at the home, make a big show of mourning and crying and weeping. And the men take the body and they carry it through the streets and the women stay at home. So what also happens? A band shows up. You need a band. If you're gonna have a parade, you need a band. A band shows up and the men and the people in the, ba in the band usually start making like dirty jokes and telling body stories while the women are weeping and crying and going nuts. It's kind of exciting. Um, anyway, so at the time the band takes off and the men of the family uh, care, the men of the family and the people who work for the funeral group carry the body off, then the women are done. Their work is done. They don't go to any of these other rituals, but they have to prepare the house for ritual feasting, which will come at the end of these rituals. So the band arrives and the mourners kind of get ready to go. The corpse is taken head first, just as children, most children are born head first. Um, the men and the band will proceed by sort of making these jokings and making body and vulgar songs. And everything as usual in India is gendered. So the men go forward to do all the rituals and the women stay in the home. We're going to talk about this gendered nature of mourning more in the next module. So as they're wandering the streets heading toward the river, people cry out, Har Har Mahadev, great, great Lord Shiva. Um, but also the people who are carrying the beer, the, the, um, who are carrying the, the body yell, Ram Nam Satya Hey, Ram Nam Satya Hey, Ram Nam Satya Hey, which means the name of Ram, that surely is truth in Hindi. The idea is Har Har Mahadev, they're calling to Shiva, Ram Nam Satya He, that is the name of truth. The idea is that these chantings keep other evil spirits at bay. And they also kind of tell the deceased who's still present and around that it's time to go. Be focused only on God, but it's time to go. So until the cremation of, or, or until the completion of all these rituals on the 12th day, um, the ghost is said to be around and to be dangerous, in fact. Um, the ghost lurks about. It causes problems. The ghost can cause bus crashes or bus crashes, bus crashes, fires, afflict, and can also get other ghosts to get in on the game. They can call other ghosts to cause a problem. 
So um, also at this time, during this whole period, nobody should really refer to the deceased. They don't want to like speak of it by name or even say father or mother. You don't really want to talk about the dead too much because that will cause the dead to remain there and it will cause the uh, ghosts to show up and you don't want the ghosts to show up. So as they are wandering to the cremation ground, six pins. Now, what are pins? Pins are a combination of different foods and one single grain or type of grain that are made into various balls. Here, there are 16 of them made in this first situation and they're used in a specific ritual way that we're gonna see throughout. So before they leave, they make 16 pins. On the way, they take these pins or dough balls and they make offerings on the way to the cremation ground. The first one is at the place of death where the guy died, boom. Second one, at the door of the house from where the corpse leaves on the journey, boom. At a crossroads on the way to the cremation ground, you'll notice that crossroads throughout world religions are considered places of power, places of danger, places where you do magic, places where you got to worry about demons and ghosts. Um, then the minute they set down the stretcher, they make another offering. Then on the fifth one, they make um, they make they make an offering at the corpse's belly before they burn it. And then after they burn the course, after, after everything has been swept into the water, they make one more offering. So that's the first six pins. We're going to see 10 more. So um, what are these pins, these dough balls that we're going to see manipulated over and over again in these rituals? Well, uh, Perry writes, um, though informants are precise about the proper time and place to make these offerings and the correct way of making them, they are invariably vague about their purpose, even, even about who receives them. And the ritual manuals in Sanskrit are not helpful on this in any way. The commonest view is that they are sacrifices or bully, which buy off the malevolent ghosts who hover around the corpse and threaten to reanimate it. What's this about reanimating it? Well, in a lot of mythological traditions, there's the idea that a corpse can be entered by a yogi, can be entered by a ghost, and can come back to life and becomes like a vampire or a zombie that can be a big problem for you. So you want to keep the dead from being reanimated by ghosts in general. So on the way to the got, now I have said that word got before, got means the space, and here's a great picture of a got right here where some bodies are being burned. Um, I grabbed all these off the internet um, using PowerPoint. I don't take pictures of these rituals in India because it's considered very rude and bad form. I have a lot of pictures of these rituals in Nepal where it's considered acceptable to take those pictures. But in general, these are pictures I grabbed off the internet. It's important for me to tell you that um, because I am not responsible for these pictures. I, I don't want the ghosts to come and get me. So on the way to the ghat, which is this, which is like the beach. Ghat is a good way to say beach. So uh, what ghats are is you have a riverbank and then you have like some ground and then you have steps up to the main area where the city is. The ghat is the steps and the riverbank. So on their way to the ghat, uh, the, the procession has to stop and meet with a specific person called a corpse clerk. I'll leave the Hindi off on that. The corpse clerk signs a death note, so like a certificate that, okay, this is okay for you to burn this person, they are dead, and gives them a special little token. Now, that token they hand to the dome that they meet. Remember, the domes are the cast of untouchables that, provide, that build the cremation pyres that sell the wood and manage the area. Now, um, the dome will then, send the, will then sell them wood, but something first needs to happen. First, they take the corpse to the river and they bathe it, offering Ganga water into its mouth. In this, they lower the body into the river and they kind of tip its head back. And the lower part of the body is supposed to be in the river. And then the holy waters are put in the mouth. Again, I think the idea here is by immersing the lower body, you're forcing the spirit up and out. Again, with so much of Indian understandings of things and Hindu religious understandings of things, you're trying to get everything to go up and out. All right, so um, this is a way that they're sort of coaxing the spirit and the soul to a prosperous direction. Now, they go back and they meet with the dome who's gonna sell them the wood. They buy wood and it's a combination of like sandalwood, bilva wood, which is wood apple, um, thorn apple, wood, a, a couple of different holy woods. So they, 
make a deal and they argue with the Domrat. There's always an argument. Um, so they argue and negotiate and they always settle on a price that's an uneven number. Now, Jonathan Perry argues that they have an uneven number so that there's a remainder or incomplete amount. But I've noticed throughout uh, India and amongst Hindus that having a odd number is always considered a good thing. So when I go and I make offerings to a deity, I always give them $11. I never give them $12 or $10. There's an idea that that uneven number is lucky and an even number is unlucky, the exact sort of inverse of how we think of it in the West. So um, the wood must have some fragments of holy woods such as sandalwood, mango wood, or wood apple. These are sacred trees. Also, they apply a lot of ghee, which is clarified butter, or resin, and lac in order to make the pyre burn well. Um, they light the funeral pyre. In fact, a very specific person, the chief mourner, lights the funeral pyre. And then as it burns, they offer incense and whatnot. And if you go there and you hang out and watch these funerals, which you're welcome to do, it smells pretty nice. I mean, they're burning bodies, but it smells very fragrant. This doesn't look like it smells good here, but I swear, it smells actually very pleasant there. <clears throat> So they burn the body and they burn the body and they burn their body until finally you see the couple kriya, which means something in Hindi like doing the skull or making the skull. Midway through the rite, the chief mourner, who should be the eldest son, if possible, will take a large staff and will crack open the skull of the corpse. This also breaks up the body so it burns better. Now, there's a lot going on here. Some people say that when the skull is cracked open, that's the point where the spirit really leaves the body. But we've seen the spirit leave the body a couple of times at this point. There's clearly no one time that the spirit leaves the body. So this is also the point where death pollution, because when a death happens, then the people in the family become polluted and they have to observe taboos or observations in order to keep themselves from polluting other people. So after this point, after the skull is cracked, uh, the chief mourner and the chief mourner's family will have a number of ritual taboos for the coming days and for the coming year. For the coming days, the chief mourner can't eat with anybody. He has to cook his own food. He has to remain separate from everybody. Uh, he has to wear specific types of clothing, unstitched clothes. He has to be shaven, all of these things. He has to observe these ritual taboos. Also, um, after the 12th day, after everything is done, they are not allowed to um, partake in the usual like festivals of the year. So, I mean, I remember my friend Raj in Nepal, <clears throat> he, his father had died and he was a good friend of mine, but Holi came around, the big festival where everybody throws colors at one another and it's fantastic. And uh, he would not get anywhere near the colored stuff. He wouldn't get anywhere near with, it, with me, like, cause I was doing, he kept me like, like a, like a foot away if I was anywhere near him that day because he was observing that death taboo because his father had died so he couldn't engage in these types of festivals. Um, some people say that the big impurity comes from the burning of body hair. And at this point, a lot of body hair has been burned. Um, other people say that, you know, when we're talking about the soul, I said that the soul leaves it a bunch of times. Some people say death happens when respiration stops, when you stop breathing. Other people say it's at the cracking of the skull. So what and where does death really start? Or does it start when the body hair starts to burn? It's, as usual with many things, it's unclear. So um, at the end of this rite, at the end of burning of the body, um, they sort of gather together any body substances and all the ashes from the funeral pyre, and they kind of sweep it together and they knock it into the river. Now, um, a nine and a four, and I should have put up that. The nine and the four look a lot like our nine and a four because our number, our numeral system in English is called Arabic numerals, but they're not actually based on Arabic. They're actually based on Indian numerals. Uh, okay, so they draw a nine and a four in the little bit of ash that's left where the body was burned. And that's supposed to represent Vishnu's conch. Vishnu uh, carries a, a conch shell and his discus. Remember, we saw Krishna with the discus many times. All right, so the chief mourner then gets a large pot of water and he hoists it over his head and he smashes it down. And then he has to turn and walk away without ever looking back. 
The large pot of water, I would argue, is another double for the skull. There's also a Hindi phrase that says that when the pot is broken, in general, anytime you break a pot, the relationship is ending. So this is also severing his connection to the dead. At this point, the, the domes come forward, the people who are members of that caste that deal with the dead and sell the wood, and they, <clears throat> they get themselves get big pots of water and wash down anything that is left into the river. So unlike cremation elsewhere, which we're gonna read about for the next module, people don't gather up the bones and the ashes to be immersed later, namely on the anniversary of death. There's no other place to immerse anything. There's no reason to take the bones and put them somewhere else. They're already at the most holy spot. Um, one other kind of interesting thing here is to think about the nature of bones and flesh. So in Hindu understandings, your bones come from the semen of your father, but the flesh and the meat and your hair all is nourished by and comes from the blood of the mother. The idea is all that's burned away, all of that from the mother is burned off and is gone, but the bones remain that are not burned. And those are considered to be almost the, um, almost the, the solidified semen of the father, tracing you back through time, through the very bodies of your family members. Now, the mourners then go to, so everybody who's mourning goes to a different got, they go to a different place from where they were, and they bathe and they do specific offerings of water. And then they eat some hot and bitter herbs. And then after that, and, and they usually go, ah, that's really hot, ah, ah. Uh, then they are given some sweets. This is said to cool down everything because everything is very hot from the burning. We're soon to see that the trip of the deceased has just begun. The chief mourner in many ways is the very rebirth of the one who has died. For the father has been sacrificed and moved on to another realm, but the son <clears throat> has also been sacrificed and reborn as the replacement of the father. What do I mean by that? You do not inherit from your father when your father dies in Hinduism. You inherit your father. You become your father. When your father dies, you become the head of the household. You become the father. In this sense, this final sacrifice of the body of the father makes the son into the father, becomes the replacement of the father, becomes the father again. Now, we do see that not everyone is burnt. So some people that are not worthy of being cremated or are considered wrong to be cremated are actually sunk in the river. What they do here is people bring those bodies of suicides, dead people, renunciates for that matter, is they bring them to the riverbank and they take fire and like a lamp and wave it around them. Then they weight down the body and they sink it out into the river. All right, so when someone is a renunciate, they've already performed their own funeral as we saw. So a person who is a renunciate, they are either, um, they're usually buried or they're buried just a few feet down and people will build a monument on top of them. The idea here is that he's already died. He's already done his own funerals. Now in some religious traditions, the main disciple of a guru or an ascetic will actually crack the skull of the guru and then sink the guru into the water. <laughs> we don't see that very often. There are stories of people who don't have any children. And if you don't have any children, then no one can do these sacrifices. Nobody can do these rituals. The person that performs them needs to be your eldest son. If you don't have any children, some people will actually, some Hindus will actually go and perform their own funeral um, to care for their own dead and their own lives when they're, and their own spirits after they die. These people are also sunk into the water. The young are not cremated. And they often say, for they have no teeth. The teeth are the sign of being old enough for someone to be sacrificed. And this is also with animal sacrifices, like the Pashu Bandhu, the, the, the <laughs> killing of an animal. They say that if a, an animal hasn't broken its gums with its teeth, then it's not worthy of being sacrificed. Someone who is snake bit, someone who dies from a snake bite, is thought to be heated. Venom is thought to like heat your body up so much that you die. So what they do is they put the corpse of a snake bite victim on a raft and then they take it out, on the out onto the river. And the idea is that the river cools down the heat of the venom so the body can be immersed. 
there's a whole thing about how one way to get around a body who's not worthy of being sacrificed, there's an alternative ritual here where you make an alternative body out of vegetables, in fact, and then you do these rituals for that alternative body. But I don't really want to go into that. It's another, it's just too much. Okay, so now we're into the sapindika. Now, sapindika means having the same ball, the same sapinda. I'm um, sharing in these little dough balls that we've been talking about. All right, so after the cremation rites, remember we're aiming to turn this recently dead ghost into an ancestor. These post-cremation rites are called shrad, which comes from the Sanskrit word shraddha. It includes two different rites, offering of the balls or pinned to the world, in fact, and feeding of Brahmins, which creates merit for the deceased. Shrad comes from shraddha, which means faith in Sanskrit. Now, shrad is thought to discharge all the debts of the deceased, uh, and that way he can become an ancestor because he has no debts to still fulfill. Um, the idea here also is that the debt can go on to the chief mourner or the son, whereas the parent once cared for the child and raised the child, now the child cares for the parent, being sure that by doing these rituals, the parent can go to a, a proper um, existence as one of the ancestors. Uh, ideally, if all the rituals are done right, the parent is liberated from their ghostly condition and is assured <clears throat> a good state. Now, with the pins, there are three sets of 16 of these offer, <coughs> offered. And 16 is sort of a holy number of completion in Hindu culture. So let's go through these a little bit more clearly. Um, all right. So your gross body is, is transfer, transformed when you die into a subtle body, a um, sukshma sharira. Now, the subtle body is thought to be the size of a thumb. Cremation has destroyed the gross body, your physical body, and sent that subtle body into the air. It can't live in your heart anymore. Uh, this tiny body is seen elsewhere, specifically in yoga, where the essential soul of the person is thought to be thumb-sized and live in the heart. So your first set <coughs> of pins, um, <clears throat> remember there were six offerings made. There's 10 here that we're calling the first set. The first set of pins that are offered, of 10, create a new body. So the offering creates a new body. And it's thought to be the size of the elbow to the tips of the finger. So it went from the size of thumb, that to elbow, the tip of the finger. You got it? The second set guides, the, so the second set of 16 offered, guides the soul on its journey to the dead. The third set destroys that temporary body, that subtle body, and sends the soul into the unincorporated land of the dead. <clears throat> While everybody will talk about these different sets of offerings, they're not often done in detail. Okay, so first off, the impure 16, the first 16. The first set of six pins were offered during the funeral processions. They're offers to spirits and obstructing demons on the path to the cremation ground. Now, the 10 that remain, and remember those first 16 were made at the house. So they made the 16, they took them with them. The remaining 10 are offered between the time of the cremation and the 10th day of the morning rite. So you offer six, cremate the body, then there's 10 days of offerings to be made. And you can see folks doing this all over the place. Uh, if you go to Benares, you see people doing this, these rituals along the Ganges all over the place. Um, okay, so you offer the next 10. They're offered <laughs> usually by, I, by the banks of the river or by a water tank of some, for, of some form. The chief mourner faces south and offers the pinned on top of some kusha grass. The pinned is offered accompanied by various things, flowers, fragrance, incense, woolen threads, resin, betel fruits, uh, different leaves, and leaf cups full of water. You can usually tell because they have the dough ball and the leaf cup full of water. You'll see people doing this. Ultimately, at the end, the pins and the offerings are all thrown in the water. Now these pins <coughs> or dough lumps are all made of a single type of grain mixed with other substances to make a paste. They actually do represent a bot, like another body of the deceased. 
The pind is said to be the same combination of semen and menstrual blood that creates the body. The pind becomes like a physical body. All right, so um, I, have a, I don't have a quote here. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> the pins create a new body for the deceased. Um, we read that one ritual specialist says, the head is made on the first day as the head of a fetus is formed in the womb by the end of the first month. The eyes, nose, and ears are formed on the second day, that second of 10 days you're offering the pins. All variants agreed, however, that what completes the body on the 10th day is the creation of hunger and thirst, or as some people put it, the creation of a digestive system. So each of those 10 offerings over those 10 days create sort of an element of the body. That new body that has been created sort of in space is acted upon to slowly transition the ghost to become an ancestor over the year that is to come after it dies. The pins are both the nourishment and the substance of the new body. Now, until that body is made, the soul is said to be a preta, a ghost with a big belly and a tiny throat, a hungry ghost. He's supposed to hang around the chief mourner, riding upon his shoulder, uh, and in fact, people will set out these kind of funny pots that they have one little hole in it and it'll drip water and the water will burst on the ground. The idea is the bursting water on the ground is broken up enough that the hungry ghost can swallow it. Okay, so the end of these 10 pins, so the 10 days after cremation, is the end of the most serious time of the death pollution for the chief mourner. After that 10th day, the souls can start to be transitioned into becoming ancestors. Then after the 12th day, <clears throat> we can see that, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> we can see that the soul is, is able to sort of do sort of ritual work. I'm, just, I'm not going to go into that detail here. So during the time up until the end of the 10 pins, so the 10 days after the cremation, the chief mourner has certain restrictions. His family can only eat one meal per day. They read out loud from a text called the Garud Pran, which is the, the text of Garuda, um, constantly at the place of where the deceased died. The household takes that one proper meal right before sunset. The chief mourner cannot sleep on a bed. He's supposed to keep a knife or an iron or a piece of iron near him at all times to protect from the evil spirits that are constantly coming after him. He can bathe, but he can't use soap. Um, he has to cook from himself for himself on a separate hearth. He must eat. <clears throat> he must eat in a way that the goat that he offers all of his food offerings to the ghost at the time during those ten pins. All right, the middle sixteen. I don't really understand these. Um, they're not often done. Pretty much, people will just do these at some point between the tenth and the twelfth day. Uh, sometimes they say this is the time where there's this ox ritual in which they set out um, like a fake moat. And the idea is that the soul crosses the fake moat, which is about them crossing the rivers and the dead. Uh, I'm not sure how this works. If this middle 16 is just something that's lingered from a time when the rituals were more complicated or whether somebody has just been speculating on it. You can never really tell. Um, but the overall notion is that you offer this middle 16 that nourishes the dead on the middle part of their journey. Okay, so now here's the big part, the highest 16. <clears throat> so this is the last part of the ritual. On the 12th day after the uh, person has been cremated, after they have died, they do these rituals. So the idea is on the 12th day, you do this ritual and they feed the dead over a one year journey to the ancestors. Now in practice, the whole 16 are offered on the 11th or the 12th day, but sometimes people will offer 360 pins um, that stand in for the 360 lunar days, lunar calendar. In the lunar calendar, there's 360 days, not 365. All right, so how do we do this? This is the first set of rites that's actually done in the home. You don't do this by the riverbank. And it is considered joyful. After the 10th day, things get happy. Those 10 days of mourning are ugly. So this is a day that's characterized by relief. It's joyous. Uh, it represents the deceased arriving in the land of the fathers after the 10th day of ritual. 
10 day of rituals in which the soul's body is being created and it's being fed. From the 10th to the 12th day, it goes to the land of the ancestors. This is supposed to take a full year, but in practice, the rituals do are done over two days. Theoretically, it takes a full year for them to get there, but they work it out in the microcosm and only do it in the, from the 10th to the 12th day, well, the 11th to the 12th day. So what is this ritual? All right, the first thing one does is feeds five Brahmins. These five Brahmins represent the ghost. The next thing one does, and I don't have a good, yeah, here we go. The next thing one does is one makes a big pin and stretches it out. Then three other pins, um, which, and this pin that you stretch out into like this like long elongated thing is supposed to be the, um, what do you call it? It's supposed to be the spirit, the soul. And then there are three other pins that are put nearby. Those other represent the deceased's father, his father's father, and his father's father's father. All these pins are made up from the leftover food from feeding of those five Brahmins at the beginning. Then they cut up that elongated pin into three parts that are merged with the pinned bodies of the father, the father's father, and the father's father. See that they take, they cut up that soul. Remember, it created a body. Now you're cutting that body up and you're intermingling it with the representations of the soul of the father, the father's father, and the father's father's father. Then all those pins are mashed into one. So this is all about taking the individual and turning it into the collective. It's suggested that these pins are the very real bodies of the dead. The mourner, in fact, picks that up and smells the pins. In this way, he's ritually consumed it. Remember how the king would smell the horse meat and the horse sacrifice? So smelling it, he actually ritually consumes it to some degree. Now, at this point, and some of them say that, that, that in some traditions, they actually eat the pin. Now, at this point on that 12th day, the mourner's good. He can go worship Ganesh. He can worship all the gods, which he hasn't been able to do at this point. Um, he's good. He's good to go. He's returned to normal. Now, at this point, we need to talk about a character called the Mahabrahman, which means the great Brahman. The Mahabrahman shows up at this point, and he's dressed in a turban, and, the and they put him in the clothes of the guy who died. He then takes away all the sins and bad karmas when he accepts payments for worship services. I haven't talked to him. I haven't talked about the Mahabrahman. He shows up in various parts and does pretty a bunch of dangerous stuff. The idea is he's a Brahmin, but he's a sketchy Brahmin. And by doing impure things, he's able to take on all the sins and debts and bad karmas of the deceased. There's a somewhat equivalent idea of this in Western culture in a thing called the sin eater, but we don't have time to get into that. So the Mahabrahman or great Brahman shows up at various parts of the rituals. This great Brahman part, Mahabrahman, is a euphemism for he does the dangerous and pure things. Uh, and he takes away pollution um, by taking ownership of the deceased family. So he takes a whole bunch of the deceased stuff. He takes payment for his services dresses up in the soul of the dead guy, and he wanders off. And the idea is nobody should ever see this guy again. <clears throat> the idea is that um, he's taking away the sins of the deceased, and you should never lay eyes on, the mourners should never lay eyes on this Brahmin again. Finally, <clears throat> the family eats, and after they eat, usually serving the many foods of the dead, they have kind of a happy feast, and then they feed a whole bunch of guests who come. So um, some offerings of pins by some groups are done again on the anniversary, the one year anniversary of the death. Um, and they also feed Brahmins on the anniversary of the death of the dead. And also, as you'll see here, pictures of the dead are displayed for a generation or two. And they're given offerings and are garlanded. You see this all over the place. The question is, what did they do before the photographs? This is a new practice because phot photography is not ancient. They didn't make a painting of the dead, but they would have something, and I'm not sure what it was that would represent the dead. By the way, we're at the end. All right, so overall, our worship rituals to the ancestors are collective. So when they worship the ancestors, the great peak trees, they worship them en masse. You don't worship your great-grandfather, your great-grandfather. You worship the faceless dead, all the ancestors together. And your whole goal in all of this is to get dear daddy or dear mummy to become like the grandfather and the great grandfather, and eventually to lose any sense of individuality or even individual memory so that all that is left 
is your notion that there was once somebody by some name, but they are now an ancestor, and may the ancestors bless us in every way. The physical destruction of the body throughout this is accompanied by the complete uh, effacement of one's individuality as a ghost. We are constantly moving in this from the individual who then dies, who's burned up, who has a ritually constructed metaphysical body by those 10 pins, who goes on a journey and is fed by the middle 16. And then at the end, the body is completely, that spectral body is destroyed and that individual ghost merges into the land of the dead to the land of the ancestors. So what does this tell us? What does this make you think about? What are our rituals for the dead? What, what happens to spirits after they die? I mean, in Christianity, they just go to heaven and you don't think about them really. We don't have a Dia de los Muertos like you have in many, um, in many cultures in South America and Mexico. We, we just put the dead, you know, we, we have a funeral. We do some kind of rituals. They're not terribly clear. And then the soul is what? Heaven or hell? Purgatory? What happens then? In Hinduism, there is a care for the dead. You would argue maybe that it sucks that they're trying to get rid of the individual version of the dead. But I would argue it's something greater and actually something more grand because you take the individual dead and steadily through these rituals, remove their individuality so they can merge with the souls of all the collective in another place in the land of the ancestors. In a sense, you're burning away and destroying all their individuality, aiding the soul in the process of letting go of their individual life and their individuality so they can live on in this grand other place where they're with their ancestors, where they are collectively together. Did you notice we didn't talk about rebirth at all? Did you notice we didn't really talk about liberation? Hinduism, it's one heck of a religion. All right, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.